Thanks for joining us today for Growth Secrets from the world's largest McDonald's franchisee. Our conversation with Dan Kurtzikov, former Chief Marketing and Digital Officer of Parcos Dorados, will start soon. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, today, I have a very special guest, Dan Gertzikov. Uh, Dan has spent the last 20 years helping organizations and team grow through adversity. Um, and we all know that the QSR space right now is facing some challenges, so we're super excited to have him with us today. Um, Dan is currently a senior advisor of McKinsey & Company. Uh, he was previously the chief commercial officer and global CMO of focused brands. They're a franchisor of seven iconic brands, including Cinnabon, Jamba Juice, uh, and Auntie Anne's. And uh, they have more than 6,000 restaurants in 50 countries. Before that, Dan was chief marketing and digital officer uh, at the largest McDonald's franchisee in the world, and they operated 2,400 restaurants in 20 countries. Uh, what I love about Dan is that he's taken a very untraditional path to the roles that he's led. Um, and he spent a lot of formative years uh, at Google uh, during its early stages. Welcome, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Well, we're excited to have you here. Uh, there's a lot we want to cover today um, around specific like growth strategies for, for QSRs. But before we get to that point, I'd love for you to share how you do that, that align yeah, with Yeah, I'm happy to do so. And if anybody's watching video of this, I'm not sitting in a forest, but my I live in Atlanta, Georgia, which they call the city within a forest. So this is my backyard here in Midtown Atlanta, um, but I am uh, not going to get hit by any acorns, I hope. Um, so yeah, my, my path into the industry when I was coming out uh, uh, as a young literally 12 years old i started to cook and thought i i spent a good 10 years thinking i want to be a professional chef uh, i applied and was accepted a culinary school and once i attended culinary school i realized how how difficult of a profession it was and that it was going to be a lifelong hobby but maybe not my profession so i set out then um and this was now 20 four years ago to try to learn 50 cuisines over 50 years. So I'd spend my vacations and holidays going to different countries about their culture through their food. So that was one kind of a passion track that I was on. And then I got professional. I, I really went deep into media early days in the mid 2000s and was both in the US and then was uh, down in Latin America. Argentina, and then I opened up Chile and Peru and Colombia. A lot of time on how do you make money with digital? How do you... industry should be thinking social media, e commerce? And I was doing that from Google's perspective. And then a, a, a mentor of mine said, Hey, look, you've been going to all these cooking schools around, around the world. Why don't you come work? with me in the restaurant industry and this is the gentleman has all these mcdonald's in latin america he's the largest franchisee not only of mcdonald's but also well, i think of pretty much anything in the world uh, and really fascinating guy that started with one in one country and 20 years later is now you know as you mentioned 2400 and I'll, I'll talk more about that and those experiences and then but i did now make a shift a couple of years ago into the franchisor side of the business at focus brands and then more most recently in the consulting advising and as you mentioned with McKinsey. So my experience is kind of anchored in digital. How do you make money from it as a franchisee? How do you think about it strategically as a franchisor? And then how do you help organizations move through that now as an advisor and a consultant? And really excited uh, if I can be helpful to work stream in this process. I guess it comes full circle. I'm now my, my, my hobby or my passion is now part of my work. And while I'm not behind the, you know, behind the oven or behind the grill, I get to help others that are and, and be part of this crazy, amazing industry, which is the restaurant space. 
Oh, I love it. I love, I love the track. So thank you so much for us. You know, um, there might be some people joining us today that are new to the QSR space, maybe thinking about opening a franchise. Uh, what's happening in the space right now? What are some of like the real big opportunities and some of the challenges we're facing? Sure. I'll start with the challenges because it is, you've made reference. It's been a challenging environment over the last couple of years with the COVID and the pandemic. And, and it's been a hard space. It's always been a difficult space to be in restaurants. Um, and so now it's harder than ever. And that being said, it's a, as big of an opportunity as ever as it's ever been. Let me let me just start. If anybody has gotten into it or is thinking about growing, one thing is remain constant. Everyone needs to eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, and a snack. That is not changing. Number two, everybody wants convenience. Everybody wants value for money. We don't have more time in our lives. We have less. So the, the things that have been true about food, there's moments when we want to have a long drawn out experience, you know, with our friends and family celebrating, romantic, all those things still exist. And those on the go need to get it in my car, delivered to my car, delivered to my house, delivered to my work. All of those new uh, versions of completely just a spin, a digitally enabled spin off of what we've always wanted, which was convenience and value for money and things of that nature. And then finally, the tech side, and it doesn't need to be more so technical, but but people don't want their people don't want uh, you know to have be less connected. I mean, we're trying to drive so that it doesn't you know overtake us. But it is a fabric of especially how young people are growing up. They just expect to be able to access anything, anywhere from any space. And so that is true as well. So when you take things, you still need to get great hot food out the door on time. That has not changed. How people found out about the food, that's changed. How they order the food, that's changed. How they get it delivered has changed. Their expectations for what you know, how technology helps them cook it or prepare it, that has changed. But the need for the food, good food at a good price with a good experience, that's constant. And so I, I wanna make sure that for all the restaurant people out there, the, the challenge is that we've added more things to the name we already had there and not gone away. You still need to create a great experience Experience at a with, you know really at really efficiently so you can make money doing it. This industry is not a high margin industry. It is still you know you've got to pay rent and you've got supply chain risk and you've got electricity and you've got all these things. Now we've got to adapt by the, to the fact that people, whether it's via their phone or via their computer or via the you know what's next in a virtual world, that is where we need to adapt. And the people that do it well are gonna profit enormously. And the people that struggle, that wanna stay with the way that it's been done, they're gonna find themselves on the outside looking in. And that is a challenge. I know it's a challenge. I, I was part of a McDonald's that has been in a transformation process. It was a challenge. But when we understood that McDonald's has always been about convenience, you know, the drive-through, it was about convenience and now delivery and pickup, drive the car and give it to you or come to your house and we'll get it to you. That's just a new definition of convenience. And when we saw it in that context, their lights went off for people and said, oh, we can work in this digital world. We just have to understand it in the context of convenience. So I'll stop there, but I think some of the challenges to answer your question are, are the same things as the opportunities. It's being connected and relevant in a world that has gone digital. You don't need to be able to write software code to be able to recognize that our children and their children and the world that we live in as adults, you know, connected to our phones is a world that is digital. And we need to make food, serve food and run a business in a digital world. And that's why I think companies like Workstream and other companies that are out there that are enabling restaurant operators and restaurant franchisors to do it. These are the companies and these are the technology plays that we need to pay attention to as an industry. And I'm happy uh, to do it with all of you today. Oh, awesome. I love the part that you called out that the people that are being successful right now are the ones that are getting the digital side of things right. 
uh, that are doing it well. Uh, and I think that you have that track record. So I'd love to talk about what you've done to start establishing some of those foundations for tech that have allowed you uh, to be successful with those strategies you've implemented over time. Right. Well, well, the one thing I, I would just mention is that the, the nature of the technology we're talking about, this is, a, and understanding the trends, this is rocket science. This is not rocket science, excuse me. <laughs> this, there, this is learnable. And that's really important. I've had multiple conversations with franchisees and folks very, very experienced. They say, well, I'm not a digital man, guy or woman. Like, I'm not digital. And I'm like, are you, I'm physically here and I've got a phone. We are both here physically and right. digitally. Let's every one of our customers experience is going to be both. There's a that was hanging up in the, the lobby of the central McDonald's office from the founder of McDonald's, a modern McDonald's, Ray Kroc. It said it's not real until it's real in the restaurants. That is exactly true about mm -hmm. digital as well. We are making digital real in the bowls that you're serving. These are real hamburgers and bowls. So I want to take to your question around what did we do first? The first was getting people comfortable with the change. This is the direction that we as a society, we as consumers, this is what we want out of the restaurant. We want it on time. We want to get benefit from sharing our data. We want to be able to get understand what our loyalty does for us, not what it does for you. These are the human conditions. This is what consumers expect. This is what we want to do when we go work somewhere. This is how we expect to be communicated to. Uh, this is how I want to be able to change my schedule. You know, all the things that we've been talking about a consumer or a growth strategy. The same is true for running the restaurant, supply chain, HR. So digital is a is not a it's a tool it's not a it's not an end in itself and that tool is learnable we do not need to be afraid of the tool we need to get have curiosity and with curiosity and some diligence you can understand a the basics of what needs to be done b how to make money from it what's the business drivers and c who are the platforms who are the players who are the tools the technology that we should be working with to be able to do it so with that as a context, that's number one, which I call direction of the bus. If I can understand the context I need to operate in, what do my consumers care about? What do my employees care about? What do my suppliers care about? If I can understand that in today's modern world, that's a lot of the heavy lifting. The second, in, in the way I keep my bus analogy, is talk about the seats of the bus. And in this context, the seats is what do I do as the franchisee? What does the franchisor do? What is their seat on that bus? What are the outside partners or vendors? What are they responsible for? And getting that right is really important. You know, at McDonald's, 70% of the menu is core, what we call core, which you call uh, uh, the quarter pounder, the chicken nuggets, like the core menu, which is true at Big Mac, every McDonald's. 30% is localized, right? So in We'd have a, um, in Brazil, you know, a local cheese oriented burger in, you know, I, I remember being in Japan and trying a shrimp burger, you know, there's oriented for local ad in India as a veggie burger. So all of these local adaptations. Well, McDonald's in this context, the seats on the bus is we do 70% of the menu, you do 30% of the menu. And if you don't, we don't argue or negotiate over, but I don't think, you know, the Big Mac's going to work here. No, the Big Mac works everywhere, and that's part of the McDonald's brand. Let's, what do we need to make it work in India or Chile or Russia? And that, that's an important, that's an example on menu, but I can still the same with um, digital, right? So McDonald's, you pay in, and most franchisees pay to the franchisor for uh, developing the brand, the color, the logo design, the big picture, what is the brand, the values of the brand. What the franchisees do is they bring it to life in the service. They do local store marketing. They connect with their community. They may do the local billboard, the local advertising. In the context of digital, they may run a local Facebook community or, or Instagram or TikTok or whatever it may be. And the brand is managing the broader advertising strategy. And that's important when it comes to digital because I've seen too many times. I'll give you an example. When I was at McDonald's, we had a... Uh, this is before we wanted to negotiate and have both. An, uh, we wanted to be available for third-party delivery, 
right? And we wanted to be wherever people wanted to order from us. So if that means third party delivery, we wanted to be there. And we also wanted to have first party delivery. We wanted an app that you could order from and you could go direct. In the same way you could buy your airline tickets on the, your favorite airline and you can buy it on Expedia. We saw that for our restaurant group. We had a franchisee that said, no, 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 no. I don't want to deal with first party. I just want to deal with, you know, the equivalent of the Uber Eats and DoorDashes of the world. And I had to sit down and say to this person, I said, look, I want to be there too. I want to get that revenue. I want to be where people order from. But you hope one day to hand this down to your kids, right? It's like, yeah, I bought this 20 year franchise and hopefully my son and daughter will one day get involved. I said, well, if you only depend on third parties, there will be no consumers and no business to hand to them. Let me be very clear about that. If if you if United Airlines said fly to London, go to Expedia to book pretty soon, all those consumers only go to Expedia to book. And pretty soon Expedia has got the leverage on the relationship. They say, well, we're going to increase the commission. And when United says, I don't want to pay that commission, Expedia says, fine, I know everybody wants to go to London. I'll, I'll work with the competitors. The same is happening in the restaurant industry. I have a ton of respect for all the third party aggregators. I've worked with all of them. They're really good at what they do. They're great technology partners, great marketers, very good at building a marketplace. But the brand is responsible for the experience. The brand has their own consumers. And we need to live in a world where consumers can choose to order from the brand or in a third party marketplace. And we as the franchise, so my example was this franchisor wanted to only franchisee only wanted to be with the third parties. And we had to say, convince them that we need to be in both so that we don't lose the connection with our own consumers. So that's right. an example of the seats on the bus. And then finally, my last thing, sorry, my I'll, I'll beat my to beat the horse of my analogy here with the, the bus is that we know what we're responsible for, what the brands are responsible for, what the partners are responsible for, the agencies, what have you, who, what are the seats on the bus? Uh, sorry, who are the people to fill those seats? And this is really important. It's important for franchisees and how do the local marketer that they hire, does that person understand digital? Do they understand social media? Are they part of the trends? Who are the vendors that we work with? You know, we can say the vendor has responsibility, but there could be 10 vendors. We got to choose the, the right vendor. Who, what is the brand? If I've got one brand and I want to add a second brand, what's the right brand for the locality that I live in and the nature of the consumers that I have and what they like to eat? So if you run that back, that playbook is what's the direction of the way that things are going? How do I lean in and be curious, lean in and learn what I don't know? That's step one. Step two is making sure I understand my role and the role of the brand, the role of partners, the role of agencies. And we have got that up front. We don't run after, you know, run our chase our own tail, trying to do things that we're not responsible for or vice versa. And then finally, who are the people? I, I, as a franchisee in this case, have to be the person that can lean in and, and adapt, but then I've got to hire a team that can lean in and adapt. I've got to work with partners who are agile. I got to work with brands who are adapting and one step ahead, not one step behind. And that would be my advice. That was the playbook I ran at McDonald's as a franchisee that in 20 countries, five language, thousands of restaurants, billions of sales. And we did a turnaround. That business is now on a new step. And the pandemic accelerated it. The, the, our competitors who didn't got are further behind. And so even in a tough situation, you can accelerate through and gain share. And that's what I've seen with the people that have leaned into digital in this. In this we're still in the pandemic, but hopefully as we come out of the pandemic, they'll be better positioned than ever to adapt to a changing world. Yeah, I love that. And I love that it's been that springboard for you to be able to be agile. Um, and you kind of had to take some risk and some bets at the beginning, right? Of these are the things that are going to be good for us long term, right? Kind of the like the example you shared of talking to that franchisee and saying, hey, if you want to hand this down to your to your kids, these are the investments you need to make. I'm curious from your standpoint, what are maybe some of the up and coming investments you think that the QSR space should be keeping an eye on? Yeah. So let me talk ones that aren't yet um, that we still got to work that are here, but we're not doing it enough. We need to go deeper and then some ones that are a little further up. 
The yeah. ones that are here is, I already made reference to it, but owning and respecting the customer data. And when I say owning, you don't really own the data, the customer owns their data. They can opt out any time. What's the value exchange? Why would they want to share their data? I mean, think about, we used to do this in a, you know, in a bowl with a business card and the catering, you know, put right. your, yeah. put your business card in, we'll do a, a raffle or you'll win, you know, lunch for the office. They were sharing their data with you by living their business card. Think about that the same way now when we're asking them to download our app or be part of our loyalty program, what's the exchange? If it's a hassle, if the person on the other side of the counter doesn't understand how the loyalty program looks like, ah, this is a pain, then no consumer wants to deal with it if, you're, if your employees don't wanna deal with it either. So that's up to us on A, the training, but B, what's the value exchange for their information with you? That relationship, if you over message, I've seen that as well. It's like, okay, we've got, you know, a thousand people on our database. We're gonna send three emails a week. Nobody wants three emails a week from their local burger chain. I'm sorry, there's nothing you can say to me that's that relevant. <laughs> I've got a lot going on in my life. You know, I want, to. If I can try the burger before somebody else, I'm in. If I can get a family discount, buy three, get a fourth, whatever it may be. But let's be reasonable on the role that our restaurant plays in their lives. We should be talking to them about the things. If I'm McDonald's, I should be talking to them about families, not about burgers. The bigger picture of, of McDonald's, at least in Latin America, is a family experience. So mm -hmm. our content and our frequency has to respect what they're interested in, not what we're interested in. The best thing you can do to build a decent sized database is start with a large database and over communicate. And then it goes down to a decent size. So, or small even. So that is really important is with the value exchange on customer data, making it real in the restaurant. That's all on the franchisee and the training and leading in the kind of environment and this isn't a big one and this over also overlaps with work stream but this is the kind of environment that you create to work will differentiate the kind of consumer experience that you have we had experiences uh, i'll tell you in Mont, we had a, you know over our thousand locations in brazil 40 percent of them are in malls the number one factor that determines consumer demand in the mall is not the promotion or the different food or different things. It's how long is the line? And yeah. how long is the line is dependent on how many people you staffed on that day. McDonald's can handle an incredible amount of throughput if they've got enough people in the kitchen and enough people serving customers. But if they don't, if they misunderstood the demand or don't have enough staff, and therefore you got two people trying to deal with a 20 person line the the person behind them looks at it and says, no way I'm going somewhere else. And in a mall, you can do that. Right. So and you're communicating to them that you, you're not serving that convenience, right? Which right. Is one of the you're things not serving talking. that convenience. And it was a staffing decision. It may be how many people you put on or your package and benefits or the nature of the work environment. The number one thing is a relationship between the manager and the staff. That's the number one uh, reason why people leave any job, including fast food, is how the, the manager treats those people. So these, and these are decisions you're choosing the manager. You get to choose if it, the, the, the man or woman is respectful and appreciative of their teams, promote that person. And the person that you know rides them hard, that person shouldn't be leading your teams. And that's your decision. And these are really, they feel like soft skills, but they lead directly to customer experience, which leads to traffic, average check, profit, retirement, all those things that everybody wants. So in any case, so that I, I talk a little bit about things we know. What are things that are coming around the corner? Um, and in the context for franchisees, supply chain, knowing what you have, how long you've had it, what you're getting, where you're getting it. There are companies that are doing this for if you've got five restaurants or you're part of a chain that of, you know, McDonald's 34,000 restaurants, getting a handle on your supply chain. The number one and two things on your P&L, and this is every restaurant in the world, is people and then food, you know, your food costs, you know, food and packaging. 
you know, and then depending on where you are, maybe real estate rental could be. But those number two, and, and by the way, real estate and rental, that has a lot to do with your off-premise business and how can you optimize a smaller footprint to serve more people homes or in their offices. But right, I'll leave right. that for a second. The, the supply chain management and understanding, I said, what you have, what you get, when you need it, how long it'll last, how you optimize, that is, I think, a net, the next frontier in uh, restaurant management. I, I'll just leave it there because it's a whole nother, we can do a whole nother webinar on that. I think um, the customer data and the exchange of experience and living that experience in the restaurant, number one, what's coming around the, the, the horn or down the track is supply chain so that you can manage number one and two in your, uh, your p &L. Thank you so much, Dan. I think this is so helpful, so insightful. Uh, we'll probably invite you back for this discussion on supply chain. So uh, yep. watch out for that. Uh, but thank you so much. Um, I think we've learned a lot from you today. If you were to give advice before we wrap up here to uh, any franchisee right now who's out there that is uh, facing some of these, you know, what do I do next? Um, what, what's like maybe like the one big piece of advice that you could give them as far as growing their business? Of all the things that you've listed today, like what's their starting point? Okay. Six words. Yeah, you didn't even ask me to do it in six words. But no, I'm I didn't. I words. love it. Okay. And, and then I'll explain the six words. Think big, start small, act fast. Let me put that in the context. I'm a franchisee. What do you mean think big? What does that have to do? The franchisees that are thinking about what is really what's going on in my customers lives what's going on with our brand are we relevant am i pushing my brand to be more relevant with the food we offer the advertising we do the experience we're creating those are the franchisees that grow and i've been a franchisor and a franchisee those are the people that lean in to the franchise advisory council that are the most vocal when the franchisor decides who they're going to grow with those are the people that are generally right you know, there's a whole gamut of people. When you look at uh, average, um, you know, average volumes in a restaurant and for any brand, there are people that sell more and people that sell less. The people that sell more are the think, my experience is the ones that think bigger. So think big in your context. Like you're not out there to solve and write the next brand campaign for the brand. That's their job. But pushing the brand on living the values in our advertising, that's important. Thinking big in the context of what is it like to be, hey, I wouldn't want to get three emails from me this week. Let's get one email. Let's not make it about the food. Let's make it about what they're going through, you know, getting ready for the holidays. Things of that nature. Add value to your customers. That for me is thinking big. I'll stop there. Second one, uh, uh, think big, start small, act fast. Start small. Look around your restaurant. Look how, look at your your start with the your team do you have restaurant managers that are the ones that are, people want to go work for are you attracting crew members that people are want to be served by do you then translate that into the experience when somebody comes up to you and says hey i downloaded this app how does this thing work and they're like i don't know that's the <laughs> franchisee's fault if they don't understand and have not trained their managers and their crew members on how the app works that created a, the brand can't do that the brand has franchisees because of this mm -hmm. know where you start small is in these micro interactions these friction points those friction points are in your restaurants and by the way the bathroom still needs to be clean you can't you know have i went to a a, a, a restaurant to be unnamed i will name the the qsr brand and I was looking and, you know, I'm getting served in the look like, you know, a dorm room of a college kid. There was food, there was crap everywhere. And I was like, this is not a place I want to eat in. Your, your, rest, your uh, consumers see that stuff. And that is where starting small, create the brand experience, make it real in the restaurant. The final act fast. I, you know, we could send around, there's two or three articles, newsletters, blog posts, you just do a Google search or any kind of search, just because I worked at Google, I don't want to advertise it on, do any kind of search. And you can, if you were to lean in and what it means to be a relevant restaurant today, you can get educated. 
acting fast has to do with that. It has to do with the people that you attract to your organization, the culture that you're building, and then just make each make incremental progress. Incremental progress over a long period of time adds up to an exponentially different experience for your consumers. That's what I would advise. This is how I try to the rest. What was the secret to McDonald's turnaround in so many countries? It was that we followed a very simple playbook. Think big, start small, act fast. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Appreciate your time today. Thanks again for joining us. If you enjoyed today's session, please consider sharing it with a colleague or on social. And if you'd like to keep up on the latest QSR trends and best practices, check us out at workstream.us forward slash blog.